Welcome to another episode of Ticket to Anywhere podcast. I'm Trizzy. And I am Leah. And remember, we are a visual podcast, so you want to get into the search bar on YouTube and search Ticket to Anywhere podcast. Also follow us on Instagram, Facebook at Ticket to Anywhere podcast, and we are on Twitter as well. We're going to be talking about Leah's residency (laughs) for one year in South America. (laughs) A.K.A. one year of backpacking, following pretty much the Gringo Trail through South America. But it was a fantastic time. I did this just a couple of years ago. And the plan was move to Buenos Aires in Argentina for the entire year and live there for the year. And then Cabo San Lucas in Mexico for Allison's 30th birthday. And the plan ended up being... Argentina, Uruguay, Chile, Brazil, Colombia, Peru, and Mexico. <laughs> so. <laughs> just threw a big curveball at Yeah, yourself. yeah. That's plans crazy. plans are, don't go to plan. Yeah. One of the biggest lessons. Don't plan. You no. can have an idea, but it's going to change. Yeah. It will change. I'm going to do more of the mediating and the questioning because I've never been to South America yet. And I am like very antsy to hear everything that Leah has to like offer today, so. Let's, All right. let's dive let's into do it. this. Yeah. <laughs> All right, baby girl. <laughs> what made you decide to go to South America in particular? So overall, I was in an industry and I was in a job that I knew I didn't want to be in for the rest of my life. Mm. I didn't want to be there forever. Um, I was ready for adventure. I was living in Las Vegas at the time. It had been like two and a half years and I was ready to get out. I was ready for more the next chapter in my life. And I went to Nicaragua for my, the first time I went to Nicaragua was New Year's 2015. I was there for 10 days with a buddy and I loved it. And I came back and I was in a really kind of dark headspace, a bit of a depression, I guess you could say, and not wanting to work. All I was thinking about was travel and leaving and, and, and not being in Vegas anymore, truthfully. Mm -hmm. Um, It just reconfirmed my decision that I'm like, you know what, maybe I do want to take a year off and go explore. Yeah, I felt like I was a different person. So I did what any traveler would do. And I booked a trip immediately right when I got back for three weeks in Europe (laughs) to literally hold me over to decide what my next step was going to be. So um, I had, I think most people go when they go on their big, long backpacking solo trip, they go to Southeast Asia because it's cheap. It's easy. There's a lot of other tourists there. You don't have to mingle with the locals if you don't want to, which defies the whole point of traveling right. sometimes. Yeah. Um, but I had minored in Spanish at school. I wanted to actually do something. I purposely wanted to do something different. Mm-hmm. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go to South America and do my big, long backpacking yeah. trip there. And there's a vast difference in the travelers mm-hmm. between those who go to South America and mm-hmm. those who go to Southeast Asia. And mm-hmm. I'm sure I'm not the only one to, to notice that. So, yeah. um, yeah, that was, that was why I decided to go to South America in particular. My job ended up getting outsourced actually. So it was the perfect oh, yeah. timing mm-hmm. for me to leave Vegas. I was like, I think actually this is a sign. This is a sign right. for me to go. Yeah. Time could have been any more perfect. But how did you prepare? What was like the money situation, the clothing and the, the researching and everything. Yeah. So I think the most I needed to prepare for was mental, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, finances, I felt like I was determined enough to change that in a heartbeat if I needed to. Because I wasn't, I wasn't a great, I wasn't great with my finances in my early 20s. Mm. Uh, As everybody else. <laughs> early, early to mid 20s, I wasn't great. I didn't really have any mentorship to kind of tell me how to divvy up my finances. So I was right. just spending whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, so it was mentally that I'm like, okay, one, step one, can I do this? Yeah. Two, am I disciplined enough to prepare for this? Mm -hmm. And that was a lot of my first half of, um, that year was like, can I do this? Am I willing to do it? Yeah. And how are you going to do it? You need to set a plan in motion. Yeah. And that year my sister got married and I was one of the maids of honor. Right. So I had a lot of financial, uh, commitments on my plate already. You know, bachelorette party, wedding, et cetera. Yeah. Um, not only that, I had all of the trips that I had planned. Right. But I basically started prepping for this a year in advance, mentally changing the way I 
thought, basically coming up with plans on, okay, what am I going to do when I'm there? Mm -hmm. What if X, Y, Z goes wrong? I need backup plans, right? Yeah. Um, I had talked to my parents, of course, first. They were my first and foremost. I'm like, okay, I'm going to tell them about this crazy idea (laughs) that I have and how I'm going to make it work. And I came prepared with like spreadsheets. There you go. Presentations, numbers. Yeah. I came prepared with numbers. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, my parents are immigrants and they're blue collar workers and their their thinking was probably like, we didn't move to this country for better life so you could leave your job and go gallivant around yeah, South yeah. America. Right. As the Filipinos like to say, gallivant gallivanting <laughs> your time elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, a lot of it was more mental. Yeah. I got my TEFL certification, teaching English as a foreign language. Mm-hmm. To truly fall back on Mm -hmm. if I needed to get a job while I was there. Because my original plan was to go there and backpack and explore and live Mm -hmm. and work online. So essentially become a digital nomad. Gotcha. My goal wasn't to get there and work Mm -hmm. five days a week, 40 hours a week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That wasn't the plan. The goal was to kind of set my own schedule and make some money here and there. But go to South America with enough money to cover me for the whole year. For sure. TEFL certification, at the time I got through International TEFL Academy, I highly, highly recommend them. We're not affiliated with them at all. I've just taken their course. Mm-hmm. They come at a premium price. I paid about $900 for my coupon, or with coupons, I paid that much to get certified online. So I was doing it after work hours. Okay. Um, completing lesson plans and testing after yeah. work hours. But you can write that off in your taxes as a professional certificate. Gotcha. So you can get some of that money back. And I th- I feel like I understand why people go to private schools now because of the connections. Not only mm-hmm. do they give you, I mean, they give you the same course. Yeah. International Devil Academy gives you the same course everyone else does. But they have groups and networks of people all over the world mm-hmm. that when you get to your country... You have this kind of group of friends yeah. that you can automatically meet up with. You can get career advice from them. You can find jobs from them. Yeah. But also, um, they provide job search guidance for life as well. Nice. And when you get something like a TEFL, and there's a few different types. There's a TESOL, TEFL, different types of teaching English as a second language certifications. Yeah, they provided the same course. I thought they were fantastic. Of a lot of the friends that I've met in South America, I've met through their Facebook groups. Mm -hmm. And um, their customer service was amazing as well. And you could do it on your own time. So it was was kind of working and going back to school again. Yeah, and this is all online. This is all online. You can go to their their headquarters in Chicago, Mm -hmm. take their course. You can also go to the country you want to get a job in and cool. take their course, mm-hmm. but you have to pay for living expenses there oh, as yeah. well. So um, that's a little different. But me, I wanted to keep making money while I was taking this course. Yeah. So I'm like, well, I'm just going to do it right. online. And did mm-hmm. you know that you were doing this for the sake of knowing that you are going to go to South America? Yep. Yeah? It was my backup plan. Okay. To be honest, like, I know... I hope I don't offend the teachers and those, the educators out there Mm -hmm. that work really hard and want to become teachers and teach. I love learning, Mm -hmm. but even more so, I love teaching. I love seeing a light light up in people's eyes and the moment that it clicks Mm -hmm. and they can kind of think for themselves. I love being able to be a part of that process. So for me, learning to be an English teacher wasn't far off Cool, because language fascinates me also. Um, so it wasn't like I'm dreading this, but I'm going to do it just in case. I was like, you know what? This is also something I'm interested in. Uh, let me see if I can uh, make something out of it. Mm -hmm. Right. Have it help benefit me while I get to help others. Definitely. And to be honest, I got to Argentina taught for about six weeks and that was it the entire year. (laughs) Because I started finding other jobs down in Argentina, um, marketing consulting online Mm -hmm. and some sales jobs, which paid me various ways, Mm -hmm. uh, PayPal and then under the table. I would, if you can make it work within your budget, Mm -hmm. highly, highly recommended Yeah, because they have such a great customer service team. They have such a great online presence. And like I said, the network that you get around the world is um, invaluable. Oh, yeah. I bet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you're kind of speaking Spanish still here. And you're still a little bit. Well. I mean, yeah. I try to. We're say a little something. So, something. No, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> what, is, 
<laughs> we're in Southern California, so you'd think we'd be speaking it right all the time. But I, it's funny because one of the ways I didn't prepare to go down to South America mm-hmm. was by practicing Spanish. Didn't practice Spanish yeah. at all. But don't worry because once you get there, all you're doing is forced to speak spanish mm-hmm. so. and one of the things that leah said to me uh before we recorded this podcast was like she likes the challenges she likes to feel oh, yeah. uncomfortable you know i do it's yeah. kind of weird yeah i'm like so comfortable being out of my comfort zone yeah. and That's i awesome. like that feeling of being like this is different this mm-hmm. is new yeah. Um, obviously if I have a little bit of knowledge on the subject, then it's better, but mm-hmm. something that pushes me, I'm like, this is great. Yeah. It's exciting. Like it's a thrill for me. That's great. I'm yeah. Envious of that. <laughs> um, also preparing talks with the parents. We have a whole episode dedicated to this, but mm-hmm. my parents are shout out. If you're watching this two two of the greatest, most supportive people, well, four my parents are both divorced and remarried Four of the greatest and supportive people on the planet because they did kind of look at me a little incredulously when I first told them I was doing this they were like you're yeah you're not you're kidding right (laughs) because you know they thought I was uh happy and complacent in my job and Mm -hmm. I was like this is not what I want to be doing forever like so you know they approached it with caution but I was able to convince them it took a lot of whining and dining them out in Vegas you know we're chatting but um I also told them that I was like, hey, this isn't happening for like another 11 months. So I have time to prepare. I also have time to change my mind. Right. Um, And I never did. (laughs) Never changed my mind. And the closer we got to it, the more I basically was open about everything with Mm -hmm. them, about my process going through it, my financials about it, what I would do as a backup, Mm -hmm. um, how I could always just come home, to be honest, if it didn't work out the more comfortable they got. So it really just took a lot of breaking in with them. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Oh, parents. Yeah. (laughs) And then I think before, like, touching on feelings and financials and packing, Mm -hmm. the feelings I had before I left, nothing but pure excitement. Oh, I bet. Because I couldn't wait to be out of my job. Yeah. It was nothing but pure excitement. Um... I wasn't, I was not even scared. People are like, you scared? I'm like, nope. Yeah. I was not at all. wondering like, were you nervous? Were you scared? Like. Nope. I was so ready to, strong. by this point I was so ready to get out of there. Yeah. Like there was no room for nervousness, yeah. anxiety. There was none of that. I was right. like, I'm so ready to get out of there. Um, and you never know until you experience it too. Right. So. Cause I was, I mean, I guess your worst fear, my worst fear was obviously going there and hating it, turning back around in two weeks. Mm. But as people will tell you, especially with travels, you never know if you don't try. Yeah. Ever. There you go. Like, if I had just not gone, you know, my mm-hmm. life would be so different right now. But that's not like me. I would go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always the risk taker here. Yep, exactly. <laughs> so my thinking was, before I left, if living in Buenos Aires, Argentina didn't work out, I'm going to go backpack the rest of South America. Literally. So that leads into the way I packed for the trip. I packed for about a week before I left, which was also back then very unlike me. I was never really that (laughs) prepared. Yeah. But I used an 80 liter backpack when, and I started off with about 35 pounds, which is way too heavy for anyone to be carrying on their back. I would not recommend packing as heavy as I did. You said 30 to 35? Yeah, about 30 to 35 pounds. That's how much I went down there. Yeah, it was heavy. It's heavy. I don't recommend pack lighter. (laughs) Um, you know, <laughs> but I went with an 80 liter backpack and I also went with a carry on suitcase, okay. um, because I was, he- was heading to Argentina in the middle of their summer. Mm-hmm. So it was like December slash new years, but then it would get <laughs> really cold, really quick. So yeah. had to be prepared for that. Mm-hmm. That was how I prepped for the trip all okay. year. Oh, the biggest mm-hmm. thing was I really changed the way I spent money for a year. Like I said, I was I was not saving. I was not a good saver. I yeah. didn't at all. I look, took stock of everything. I went back to a zero-based budget, essentially, where okay. my every dollar yeah. of my income was going to something. Nice. It was in a bucket. So I noticed that I was spending almost $300 a month on clothing. A month. Jeez. And I was like, this is, ins- this is like a flight. Right. Round-trip flight yeah. to somewhere. So cut that out immediately. Yep. Good. Stop doing my nails. Mm-hmm. Um, I make coffee most days anyway. Yeah. And also, coffee is, you want to know something about me? Coffee's my vice. 
it's the one thing I will never give, stop spending money yeah, on. Yeah. If it costs me $100 a month, I'll still spend money on it. Yeah. I don't care. Um, stop doing my nails. Stop shopping. Those are the two biggest things. Stopped. Um, this was really hard because I didn't really tell many people that I was going to do this mm-hmm. until right before I did it. Because I didn't okay. want any of my plans to backfire and then me not go because uh, then I'd be kind yeah, of held yeah. accountable by right. everyone. Yeah. So the last five months before I left, I stopped going out with my friends a lot. And mm-hmm. I was going out with my friends a lot. And we we're spending $100 every night. And this is Vegas too, This right? Vegas. Oops. This was easy to spend yeah. money. Right. Um, but I stopped doing that a lot for the sake of knowing that like I'm going to have this amazing year of adventure ahead. Yeah. And I'd rather spend the money there yeah. than the things that we were repeatedly doing in exactly. Las Vegas. Been so. there, done that. Yeah. 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 And so um, it was hard for me because, like I said, I was used to just throwing around money like it was Monopoly money. <laughs> <laughs> so. Hey. Yeah. But so what was your budget then? Like how did you figure things out? Right. It- A way that I was able to figure out what I needed was reading, uh, obviously, a ton of travel blogs, mm-hmm. a lot of expat expat blogs and joining a lot of expat groups for those of you that don't know what an expat is Mm -hmm. it's short for expatriate it's Mm -hmm. basically someone that moves from their home country to another country and settles down to live and work um and you know if you're not working you're technically not an expat i guess but it's just easier to say expat gotcha you're basically just a foreigner living in that country but it's just easy to say expat so I was able to kind of take all the information I gathered from all these sources and come up with an idea of how much I'd need to, like, live in Argentina, right? Yeah. So, um, before I left, I saved a little over eight grand. Nice. For, and I thought that was going to work for me for a year. Mm -hmm. Um, I did get throughout the year about six grand in inheritance. Okay. And then I worked... Odd jobs here and there, Mm -hmm. which gave me, um, I don't know, all in all, maybe another one to two grand. Nice. Just working randomly. And I also got a a settlement from a large entertainment company. (laughs) Settled some settlement money, which came as a surprise while I was in Argentina. So that was another grand. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Um, And that was because they weren't paying their interns back in their day when I was an intern. So someone won a lawsuit. We all got paid out. Yeah, it was nice. And then I got my tax return back, which was, you know, a couple grand also. Okay. So money here and there that I wasn't really counting on. Mm -hmm. What I had kept in mind was how much I had saved through my own hard work, right? Yeah. That was the main, Mm -hmm. the main uh, number. Yeah. Um. And then I'll get more into it later, but the last three, four months of the year, I was actually working for accommodation through Peru, bartending my way through Peru. Nice. So not that I wasn't spending money, but it slowed my spending way oh, down. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. For when I was going there, I kind of just came up with a number in my head yeah. via blogs and resources. Yeah. What you felt comfortable with. Exactly. Okay. But it was, my thinking was more like, I'm going to challenge myself in the year leading up to leaving, to save as much of my paycheck as possible Mm -hmm. and then go to South America with that number. Yeah. And because my rent was dirt cheap in Las Vegas (laughs) and I was paying it on my own, even though I lived in a two-bedroom, I got a roommate. My rent ended up being, for the last year in Vegas, $400. Ah. So it was like nothing coming out of my paycheck. So I was able to save every paycheck, almost half of it. That's... In order to wow. go to South America with that money. Yeah. That's great. Mm-hmm. Okay. So going back to like the preparation parts, I know a lot of the countries that you go to, you need visas. Mm-hmm. What mm-hmm. was the whole situation with that? <laughs> um, this was a few years ago. So the laws have all completely changed, which blows my mind. Uh, <laughs> these days, you can go to Argentina and Brazil without a visa as an american you do not need a visa to enter the country you just need a valid passport Mm -hmm. Uh, that was not the case when i visited these countries argentina i paid 160 dollars twice because i messed up the first time so that was my bad but i paid that to get that visa four months later the u.s or argentina lifted that requirement so that you don't even need a visa to oh, visit Argentina man. anymore as an American. So I paid $320 for literally nothing. 
Did they offer any refunds to or get anything? No, <laughs> hell no. <laughs> refund. Can I submit for a cancellation know, request? Right? Oh my gosh, that hurts. <laughs> None of that. It hurts. Um, one of the things about Argentina, though, because you can stay in the country for 90 days, uh, you do have to prove, you basically have to show an exit out of the country. There are a few ways you can get around this, Mm -hmm. and a lot of travel people will tell you this. There are sites online where you can honestly place a hold on a fake airline ticket, Uh, and then if you show that to the ticketing agent at the desk, Mm -hmm. um, they may or may not accept it. It just all depends. And then Brazil, I paid $200. In Argentina, I got my Brazilian (laughs) Brazilian. Visa in Argentina, which still blows my mind <laughs> as an American. And then uh, four months later, they lifted that visa so everyone can go to the Olympics. Oh, man. Yeah. And so um, spent a lot of money on that one. And now Americans don't even need a visa to get yeah. in there anymore. Uh, the other countries I visited that year, you don't need a visa for as an American. So Uruguay, Chile, mm-hmm. Colombia, and Peru, you can all stay up to 30 to 90 days depending on what your nationality is. Mm -hmm. Um, Blowing money like it's nothing. (laughs) Man, I spent like half a grand on visas that I didn't end up needing four months later. Yeah. Yeah. It hurts. But if I didn't have them, I couldn't get into the countries in the first place. That's true. So, yeah. So when you got there, how how was everything like? Tell us. Oh, man. When I got there, I was excited as I had been all year. Mm -hmm. Um, I was finding different ways to meet people, whether it was through Facebook groups or through meetup groups. A lot of them were on Facebook. It was one of the easier ways to connect. Yeah. Because Facebook always... uh, Facebook not only acts as um, meetup groups, but they also act as messaging service. Yeah. So it's easy to get in contact with people as well, as well as find events. It was always exciting when I was with other people. First few weeks, I was on a high. Mm -hmm. You know, I spent my... Spent New Year's in Buenos Aires, like, on the streets, partying with everyone else. Two weeks after exploring Buenos Aires, Argentina, figuring out, kind of getting a taste for the city, Mm -hmm. um, I went to Uruguay for a week. I went to Punta del Este in the middle of their summer, beautiful Mm -hmm. surf town. Um, Uruguay is pretty expensive, by the way. Like, I think they have a really strong economy, so um, they have a strong currency, the cool thing is, like, in most of their shops and restaurants, they accept mm-hmm. most forms of payment as they accept euros, they accept American dollars, they mm-hmm. accept pesos. Okay. Yeah. And what's furthermore, if you pay with a card, mm-hmm. they give you a discount. Nice. Which is nuts to me. I'm like, that's Wait, weird. Yeah. yeah. Wait, hold on. They'll yeah. literally give you 10 <laughs> to 15% discount if you pay with a card. Cool. I can't remember what the rule on that is, yeah. but... Um, I thought that was really cool. That's but yeah, I went I went to lunch with a few friends there and just for me alone I paid twenty seven US. Nice. Just for like a plate and right. a drink. I'm like, this is really expensive. Yeah, that is. For that's kind of baller. Yeah. It's a little baller. So yeah. um got a feel for it. But then, you know, after I started I came back to Buenos Aires, uh started looking for an apartment to settle in with. Okay. I ended up finding a three bedroom apartment on the sixteenth floor in Palermo, which is the most expat foreigner Mm. neighborhood in Buenos Aires. So it's kind of a safe neighborhood to move to because a lot of English speaking people. Yeah. Um, Beautiful 16th floor views. I lived with an Argentine guy and a French girl. Cool. Yeah. They were so sweet. They're both going to school there. Yeah. And I loved it. It really felt like home. Yeah. Uh, My rent at the time was only 310 for my room, which is actually quite pricey for a room in oh, Argentina, okay. but to an American, that's, that's nothing. Right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, and we all shared a bathroom, which was fine, but it was just in a good place. It was in a good neighborhood. You could walk to everywhere you need. Your markets, your bars, mm-hmm. your restaurants, your clubs. Yeah. Um, and you take public transportation everywhere nice. in in Buenos Aires as well. So there's bus stops. Okay. Subte, Subte is the subway, the underground there. Subte. Subte, the Subte stops like a 10 minute walk away. Nice. So, uh, excellent area. Yeah. And, and how, um, how was the public transportation? There? Public transportation was great, except okay. for when they went on strike, <laughs> which they do a lot yeah. in any South American city. Mm-hmm. Uh, luckily I never had any problems 
and with any when you're in any foreign place you yeah. want to watch your belongings keep them close to you For sure. uh you know be aware of your surroundings mm-hmm. i luckily ran into no trouble mm-hmm. while i was there i honestly think overall the mm-hmm. whole year i was at a big advantage being in south america yeah truly because of the color of my skin uh-huh. where it works in my favor yeah. that way because i was dark or mm-hmm. i am dark <laughs> It's still dark. I feel like um, I, people kind of had to do a double take and make like at first they don't think I'm a foreigner, okay, because dark hair, dark skin, yeah, yeah. But then they hear the way I speak Spanish, they're like, oh yeah, well, this girl, yeah. no, she's not a native, she's not she a don't local, because you do get a different kind of treatment. You know, people will mm-hmm. see you as a foreigner. People will will try to mess with you, try to overcharge you. Oh, for sure. And, um, but the, the second I started speaking Spanish, they'd be like, oh yeah, this girl's not from here. <laughs> so, but you know what? The fact that I try made a big difference. It made the biggest difference in Colombia, which I'll, I'll yeah. get to, I think. But, um, the Spanish is very different for those of you that haven't been to Argentina. The Spanish is very, very different there. It's also very, even more different when you get to the city of Buenos Aires. Mm. Um, they, their accents are a little bit different. Uh, they call themselves porteños. That's like you know, a native of the city oh, and, mm-hmm. okay. and, uh, yeah, it's just, just a little bit of a different culture is big, big culture shock when I got there. So it did take me a while to adjust. Uh, when I was with foreigners and friends, it was fine. Yeah. Speaking to the locals, I felt really truthfully, I felt, um, not unappreciated, but embarrassed a lot because they just Aww. would pretend to not understand what I'm saying. And y'all, my Spanish is not that bad, <laughs> but because I wasn't speaking in their accent. Ah. For example, like um, the word pollo mm-hmm. is chicken in mm-hmm. Spanish with the double L. They pronounce their double L like a sh sound. Okay. So instead of pollo, it's pollo. Pollo. Yep. Pollo, arroz con pollo. Wow. So, like, rice with chicken, and that took me a lot. That took me months to get adjusted to, because I'm like, what are they saying? I don't know that yeah. vowel. I don't know those those consonants. I don't know right. those letters, even with all my Spanish training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then when I was alone, you know, I would get into the deep, dark thoughts in my head, like, am I am I okay here alone? Yeah. Like, you're missing all this back home. You're missing your friends. Right. Do you still want to do this? Yeah. Are you going to have enough money? Mm-hmm. Do you know what you're doing? Yeah. Are you making any new friends? What is the point of you being here? Like, yeah. you get into your own head. Oh. So, right. it was... I'm, I'm a social person anyway. Right. But I tried not to be alone at the beginning as much as I could because I was going to get into my own head. Yeah. Although, throughout the year, I noticed a massive change in myself that... Um. I it was it I became so comfortable being alone because I went on this huge adventure. I moved to South America alone. Yeah. Like in the end it's only, you know, you and yourself. Like right. you got to take care of yourself, right? Definitely. That includes your thoughts. Yeah, for sure. Every day, whether you're traveling or not, take care of your thoughts. Mm-hmm. One quote I love is um take care of your words when you're with others and take care of your thoughts when you're alone. Aww. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah. It's a good thing to think Indeed. about. Yeah. <laughs> so, um you know, adjusting, I found, like I said earlier, I found a lot of Facebook uh, expat groups, a lot of traveler groups, and was able to connect and meet up with people there. Yeah. A lot of them I didn't stay friends with. A lot of them I did. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it all depends on the time you put into people. Exactly. Which is also one of the biggest lessons I learned in South America is that, like, the time is irreplaceable. Mm-hmm. Time with people. I learned how to do that better than anything else right. that year. Yeah. Anything else. Once you got there, how was that like? Well, I did Argentina first for six okay. months, all the adjusting to that, and I finally found my groove a few months in. Nice. Um, we oh, got a groove back. <laughs> got my groove <laughs> back. <laughs> but once I was there, I also visited Uruguay twice. I visited Chile once, and I visited Brazil once, okay. each time for about a week. And Chile and Brazil, I actually met this group of three Americans and one German. Okay who they were all, they all worked online or they all had their own businesses. Um, And they were really important to me that year because they taught me how to slow travel. Okay. 
and it wasn't all about rushing to a new city yeah. every two, three days. They would spend a month, two months, three months wow. in the city and really learn to live like the locals. The locals. Yep. And um, two of them are the co-founders of Nomadics Towel Company. Sweet. So shout out to you, hey. <laughs> Zach and Chase and Mia and Elena. Um, they know how important they were to me that yeah. year. So That's awesome. Um, they were a big part of my year and they invited mm-hmm. me to Chile with them for Elena's birthday. Aww. And so that was a lot of fun being able to see like Valpo and yeah. we went to Cochuaga Valley to go wine tasting. Okay. Um, where Carmenere is from, that varietal. Nice. One of my favorite wines. And the next month, I met up with them in, in Rio, in Brazil. Wow. So it was really cool seeing them uh, in a few different places. And then I crossed over with them in Colombia in July of that year for like two days. So really, That's I so hung cool. out with them in four different countries. Nice. Yeah, which was Aww. which was amazing. And um, I was like, slow travel, what is this? And it became an important, <laughs> it became a really important part of that, right. that year. And it really, truly changed the way I travel mm-hmm. from now on, up from then on yeah. up until now, I try to spend at least three to four days yeah. in a city. That's good. Just to kind of do the touristy things, but also do the local things. Right. So, so after six months in Argentina, it got cold and it got expensive. So mm-hmm. I was like, let's move to Colombia. Let's do this. Let's backpack around Colombia and let's see what it's like. Let's, you know, set yourself up in an apartment. I picked Medellin as my home base. Uh, sorry, Medellin. See, I still say Medellin, 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 but if you say it with a Porteño accent, it's Medellin. It's the double L. (laughs) Yeah. The double L, the sound. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing that I learned during the six months, I had so many plans. Yeah. My first six months in Argentina, I had so many plans. And every time I changed my mind about something, mm-hmm. I would go and tell everyone about it, especially people back home. Yeah. And they'd be like, that's cool. Oh, you're changing your mind again? And yeah. by the time I had decided I was going to move to Colombia, everyone was like, but I thought you were going to stay in Argentina. And I kind of threw my hands up and I was like, you know what? I'm not telling anyone my plans anymore <laughs> because you all are holding me too accountable. Right. And you can just look on my Instagram to right. see where I am. Exactly. So <laughs> Do you. Yeah. So I wasn't telling anyone my plans anymore because they were cha- just changing so often. I'm like, I don't have time to update everyone. Uh-huh. Just get on the gram and see where I am. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so. That's awesome. Yeah. I felt like six months in Argentina, there's so much to do, especially now. They've built it up so much. Yeah. While I was there, I visited Mendoza, wine country. I went down to Bariloche in okay. Patagonia. Ooh. One of the most beautiful hiking regions yeah. on the planet. Yeah. And um, they, it, it felt like, I don't know, it was cold and expensive. It was like, okay, I think I'm done with this country mm-hmm. for now. I'm ready to yeah. see more. I'm ready to be in the sunshine again awesome. because I am a lizard and I thrive in that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Colombia, once I got there, I think the main thing was that my Spanish wasn't ridiculed anymore, and that okay. made me feel at home instantly. Yeah. The first cab I got into in Colombia, yeah. the guy was like, in Spanish, he's like, oh, you speak great Spanish. I'm Aww. like, oh my gosh. Yo intenta. <laughs> <laughs> I try. I told him I try. Uh-huh. Um, and he's like, that's great. You know, keep practicing. And yeah. like, they, the people of Colombia were so welcoming yeah. that you were even trying to speak their language. Mm-hmm. That it That's made awesome. me feel at home instantly because yeah. I'm like, oh my god, I can get by with doing maybe a half ass sentence, right? And they'll still appreciate it. Where I felt like, as in Argentina, it like they would pretend to not know what I'm saying because mm-hmm. I wasn't saying it their way, right? Right. So it was a little disheartening. It was discouraging. Mm-hmm. That was the word I was gotcha. looking for er- okay. earlier. And you know, it was just warmer in Colombia. Yeah. They have a bad, they had a bad reputation for a long time, as yes. we all know. People watch Narcos and they think that's the real yeah, thing. Like, right. <laughs> they think that's a real thing. There's so much more to Colombia than that. And also, like, yeah. they don't want to be known for their drug cartel past. For sure. Yeah. So, not only has it been on the rise in travel for years now, mm-hmm. I mean, now it's well, well, well traveled. Yeah. Colombia is. Like, it's almost one of the normal countries yeah. to go to. Um, but I think people were trying to change outsiders' perception of that of that drug cartel past, which is why everyone I met was so welcoming. Yeah. And they were like, do you love our country? I literally would get all the time, do you love our country? Will you go tell others about it? Tell people how great it is to come here. Because, you know, a lot of their income is is tourism as well. 
So I love it already. Yeah. <laughs> you need that. to get there. Like yeah. it's it really is amazing. Um so much terrain, so much to do, so many different terrains. Like, yeah. it's kind of something for everyone. Awesome. The people are incredible. There's just something about the sun that brings out, like, the warmth Aww. in people, yeah. you know? So, um, uh, Peru. Peru, I think, changed. When I got to Peru, I think that changed the entire year. Because that is where I bartended my way. Okay, that was there. Okay, I thought and it was Colombia. No, it was it Peru. Was Peru. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I bartended my way through Peru by volunteering at hostel bars. Sweet. This is essentially work for accommodation. Yeah. And the way I found this was, mm-hmm. I knew, I mean, I had been on the road for nine months at this point. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you talk to people, get to know, and you know there's these big party hostels all yeah. over South America. That are always looking for bar staff. Well, I'm going to email the bar managers and tell them I'm coming and yeah. ask them for a bar a spot on the bar staff. Yeah. And I don't know if I went during low season or what, right. but every time I did it, it worked. And they're nice. like, yeah, like just check in when you get here and you can start working that day if you want. That's crazy. So what you get when you work for accommodation in, in a bar, this is pretty typical everywhere you go around mm-hmm. the world. You get a bed in the staff room, which staff room, you can imagine what the staff room is like. <laughs> <laughs> but it was five of us crammed into one of the staff rooms and another five crammed into um, the other staff room. You get one bunk bed and then you get... Uh, one meal per day, and the meals at the hostels I was working at mm-hmm. were big meals. Okay. And then nice. you got 40% off of your bar tab. Nice. Which you had okay. to pay out, like, every other week. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Okay. Shout out to Loki and Wild Rover out in Peru. You guys definitely changed my year that Aww. year. Yeah, those two hostels have a special place in my heart. It's but the, they're f- mm-hmm. famous party famous party hostels. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. How long did you spend at each? So I did two weeks in Loki, Lima. Lima is the capital of Peru. Okay. Then um, I did two weeks in Wild Rover, Arequipa. Nice. Which is where, which is the south. So it's like a dusty white town, mm-hmm. but it, I thought it was great. It's the desert, essentially. Yeah. And then I did um, six weeks in Loki, Cusco. And Cusco is okay. the jump off point for Machu Picchu. Nice. Uh, the great thing about these hostel bars is that anyone can go to the bars. Obviously, if you want to pay for to stay at the hostel, you pay for a bed in yeah. either the separate building or upstairs. But the great thing about the bars being open to everyone is that the locals can come in as well. Awesome. So you get to mingle with the local. Yeah. It's like a normal bar. Anyone right. can go into it. Cool. Which I thought was amazing because then then you mix with yeah different you people. Get, yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. So some of the big differences between all the countries I really resided in for long periods of time, like uh, was the shopping and the availability of goods. Obviously, okay. when you're gone for a year, you yeah. don't have the comforts of home, yeah. right? And you either have to find an equivalent or you have to bring them with you, yeah. which no way in hell is going to bring them with me. <laughs> um, that was yeah. also a big part of my mental process was learning the the year before I left, learning to, l- I'm going to be living very, very differently for the next year yeah. and adjusting my thinking to that. Right. So you're either going to have to learn to live without the products, mm-hmm. Leah, or you're going to have to find similar products. Yeah. Or you're going to have to bring them from home. And that was, like, not not even an option. Like, yeah. if you're backpacking, you're not going to bring all this exactly. stuff you need. It's already at 35 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> Don't be like me. Yeah. <laughs> I've learned my lesson. I can pack with, like, mm, like 22, 23 pounds now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, Argentina, since I was there for six months, that was probably the most difficult country to find the comforts of home in because their import laws are very strict. They're mm-hmm. very different. Okay. They don't have a lot of foreign products at all. Zero Apple products in the country. Mm. If they are sold, they're sold illegally or on the black market or you have to get them from a foreigner. Yeah. And they're literally triple the price. And uh, there's a high rate of, don't know how correlated they are, but I felt like there was, I mean, there is still a high rate of yeah. of burglaries, robberies. Um, so we're always told to, you know, keep your phone close to you. Don't really take it out in public. Mm-hmm. If you do need to take it out for maps, um, maybe kind of step into a store and do it. But a lot of, you know, people on motorbikes will speed by and grab the phone out of your hands. Crazy. Yeah. So um, even if you wanted things like 
uh, different spices or certain products, mm-hmm. you'd have to go to Barrio Chino, which is okay. Chinatown in Buenos Aires. Gotcha. Or you get on one of these buy and sell expat groups and see if anyone's selling anything. Or a lot of people would pay people like, hey, is anyone going to like the States or Canada or Europe? Can you bring back this and I'll pay you for it? So wow. literally there's a service down there. I can't remember what it's called, yeah. but it's like muling products into okay. the country. Um, for a small fee. Yeah. Do you get questioned from like borders? TSA um, like if they decide to open up your bag. Okay. Right. So if it's like a lot of liquids, gotcha. but, um, but you, you could check it all in. Yeah. You okay. can check it in. So my mom, <laughs> I wanted to make a few extra bucks when I was down there. My family, my aunties and uncle and mom visited me in that June. So it was <laughs> middle of winter uh-huh. and my mom brought me four bottles, big bottles of sriracha <laughs> and four tubes of Maybelline mascara, my favorite ones. Yeah. And I sold them all for like double the price. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. And they flew like hotcakes, yeah. especially the sriracha. Nice. Because Argentines like don't believe in spice in their cuisine. Mm. Yeah. Also with food down that. food down there, I wasn't impressed, but I don't eat meat. Oh, uh, okay. So well I did eat I think I did eat meat for two weeks down there just yeah. to say I ate meat and yeah. then I was and I was sick the entire time because I hadn't mm. eaten meat in three years. Aww. But just to say I tried it and then yeah. I went back to not eating it. Gotcha. So I cooked a lot at home, like a lot of my own vegetables and salads and okay. quinoa and whatnot. Right. But they don't like spices down there? That is very things are like spicy. things are very bland. Interesting. In Argentina, yeah. Okay. Like they have chimichurri. Okay. Yeah, Which you yeah. know is garlic, olive For oil, sure. and cheese. You go there, girl. I'm telling you, you go to like a paria mm-hmm. or like an asado, which is a okay. barbecue. Yeah. A paria is a grill. Mm-hmm. So you go to a restaurant and you'll get like steak and fries. I'm not even kidding. There will be no flavor to them. Really. Even my friends that eat meat, that's yeah. what they say. They'd be like, it's bland, but wow. like the 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 meat is good. Yeah. Okay. You got to add, and then they'll add like salt. Huh. Not even like pepper, like salt. Just salt. Yeah, so you gotta... I need pepper on my steak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, the cuisine is... I mean, if you like meat, you like steak. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Cuisine got a little different once you went up to Colombia, you know. Yeah. Lot, lot more fruits and vegetables, okay. obviously, because it's a tropical country. For sure. But yeah, imports are different in Argentina. Not a lot of foreign products. Once I got to Chile, Colombia, Peru... The import laws are different there where there's a lot of foreign products. So it was kind of cool after being in Argentina for six months, going to Colombia and you go to an Exito, Mm -hmm. which is like a Walmart. And they had so many things from Europe and Asia and North America. And you're like, oh my gosh, like it's, I can get products I'm familiar with. You could find like, not that I was searching, but you Mm -hmm. could find Kraft mac and cheese and you could find bottles of sriracha on the shelf. For a normal price. <laughs> Put we out of business. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I can't slay my sriracha anymore. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> so the shopping was interesting. Okay. Um, I very luckily met up with my family twice during the year. Mm-hmm. My aunties and uncles came to me in Argentina and awesome. they brought me the comforts of home, things that I needed. I have a very specific eyebrow pencil and a yeah. foundation. Okay. Stuff you would never be able to find this in Argentina. Yeah. So they br- and it's literally it's like Laura Mercier and Anastasia. Yeah. So very common here, mm-hmm. not common at all in South America. Uh, so they yeah. brought them for me, and then uh, two of my best friends and my sister met up with me in Colombia three months later, yeah. and they brought me a lot of stuff nice. as well. And every time I saw my family, I mm-hmm. actually sent clothing back home with them to okay. like change for the yeah, season yeah. change. Oh, that's so cool. And so it lightened my <laughs> load. Yeah. Yeah. So by the end of the year, I think I was packing at a normal rate, like 25 pounds or less. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sweet, sweet. (laughs) Tell us about your favorite part of the country. (laughs) Each country. Yeah. Each country. I'll I'll just do the big countries that I went to, the main three. Um, I think overall, my favorite part of the entire year Mm. was that I was forced to speak Spanish the entire year. And to some, that sounds like a nightmare, (laughs) like speaking a foreign language for an entire year. Yeah. But for me, like I mentioned earlier, mm. I love that thrill of being out of my comfort zone. Yeah. And I, yes, I did hang out with a lot of travelers and backpackers. So I was speaking Spanish for mm-hmm. good for, I mean, I was speaking English for most of the year, right? Yeah. But there were a lot of times I was hanging out with these people and they didn't speak a lick of Spanish. So I'd literally have to carry <laughs> the whole group on my back with my That's Spanish. Awesome. Yeah. 
And I think one of my favorite memories was we were at the stadium in in Medellin, in Colombia. Mm. And we were kind of late to this uh, football, this soccer game. Uh The police came up to us. I was the only one that spoke Spanish in this group of six Uh people. And they were just like, do you need help? We can walk you. And I, at first I hesitated because I was like, oh, are we in trouble? Like, is this a good idea? Yeah, yeah. But they literally just wanted to walk and talk with this group of foreigners. Aww. And they told me my Spanish was great. And um, nice. they were like, where are you from? Yeah. And I was like, oh, I'm the only one that speaks Spanish in this group. <laughs> and so it was actually really cool. They literally, it's yeah. like we got a personal escort to our seats. That's awesome. Yeah, it was one of my wow, favorite memories. Like VIP treatment. Yeah. <laughs> and it, I think it... I mean, I think they're really part of that group that's trying to change your perception of Colombia, yeah. right? They're yeah. like, let's be nice to these foreigners because they're going to go and tell their friends, exactly. go to Colombia and travel. That's good. Mm-hmm. Okay. And in South America, just like Filipinos mm-hmm. and a lot of Asians, they're big on family, they're big on community, they're big oh, on yeah. sharing. Yeah. So that was also comfortable too because I'm a very social person. I'm very, like, I love being in groups. I love being alone, but I love being, you know, in big communities. Yeah. And there's no shortage of that in awesome. South America. So yeah. that was a, a big thing I loved about the, the culture. Yeah. Um, any In any of the, the countries that you'd go to down there. Mm-hmm. Favorite part about Argentina? Everything starts really late. Ah, uh, they're all turnt. Really <laughs> late. Like, they do a merienda, which actually okay. I found out only how... They, the, techn- the term merienda is only used in one other country in the world besides Argentina, and it's in the Philippines. Ooh, okay. <laughs> and a merienda is a late afternoon snack because you're not going to eat dinner for another couple hours. So merienda happens between 5 and 6 p.m., and it's basically your pre-dinner snack. If you don't know, in Argentina, they don't eat dinner earlier than 9 p.m. I'm not even kidding. What? Restaurants don't even open huh. until 9 p.m. Yeah. At, like, they'll, they'll open for lunch and they'll close and then not op- reopen at 9 p.m., which is dinner time. My bedtime's 8.30. I know. <laughs> Girl, you got to adjust. And so it took a lot of adjusting, but I ended up loving it. So the late dinners I would get used to, but a lot of restaurants wouldn't even be open till 9 p.m. So you could eat and drink until you went out Mm -hmm. or you could go home and chill before going out again but pre-games yeah uh what do they call them oh previa okay so a pre-game in like argentine spanish is called a previa where you go to someone's house and drinks before you go out and drink right wow straight up that wouldn't start till like 11 30 midnight sometimes and then when you go out to the actual club bar that's like 1 a.m 2 a.m I'm not even kidding. I don't think I can hang. Yeah. <laughs> it's Ooh. so late. Should have so. done this 10 years ago. That's <laughs> what I should have done. It's very, very late. And places will stay open. Like place, yeah. I had friends not showing up at the clubs until 4 a.m. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. 4 a.m. And they and we would be out, I mean, on the weekends, not most weeknights, but on the weekends, we'd be out till 8, 9 a.m. in the morning. What? It's very, like, Spanish oh of gosh. them, you know? Like, yeah. that's what you do in a lot of places in yeah. Europe. I'm not even kidding. And then there will be some after parties starting at like 7 a.m. Wow. <laughs> they come to America and they're like, okay, boring. Yeah, boring. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and my my best friend down in Argentina, Annie, mm-hmm. yeah. she is Norwegian. And her and I, I remember we went out to Rose Bar in Palermo one night. We're going to very, very popular expat club okay. in Palermo. And But we were so tired, but so determined to party. We actually went back to my place, only a few blocks away, uh-huh. and took a nap between 12 p- a.m. and 1 a.m. Oh, wow. Between midnight and 1 a.m. We <laughs> took a nap, and then we went out to the club. A nap. Wow. <laughs> so. Okay. Yeah, so everything starts really late, but we got used to it, and I loved it, because I yeah. felt like I could take my time. True. You know, yeah, yeah. a lot of times, even, I'm just a perpetually late person. Mm. So even here at home in the U.S. and L.A., like... She's on Filipino time. Yeah, Filipino time all the time. We'll say 8 a.m. and it ends up being 10 10 a.m. Sorry, Trissy. (laughs) So that was my favorite thing about Argentina. Favorite thing about Colombia. Oh, man. I think if you talk to any traveler, Mm. Colombia will be... Have a, has a special place in their heart because it's yeah. truly almost every traveler's favorite South American destination Aww, because nice. of the difference in terrains. Like yeah. you get the beach, you get the desert, you get the mountains, you get the jungle, right. you get the temperate uh, regions, yeah. the moderate weather. <clears throat> like Medellin is a city, they call it the city of eternal spring because okay. it's always like a good like 70, 75 degrees there. 
cool. and sunny. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's yeah. up in the mountains, okay. and it's just, it's absolutely gorgeous. And, you know, they do, they dance a lot of salsa there, so you're always hey, dancing salsa nice. for free. You're always getting someone okay. to teach you. How much you pay for a salsa lesson in the U.S.? Like $25 yeah. to $50? You mm-hmm. get that for free on the streets in Colombia. Nice. So cool. good. And the people are curious. They're they're welcoming, you yeah. know, just don't stick out as a gringo. Just you know, just be just be aware of your surroundings, mm. just like anywhere you travel and right. um the Spanish, one thing they're very proud of is they believe their Spanish is more neutral and it is. Okay. So if you want to learn Spanish, yeah. Colombia is a good place to start. Nice. Um I actually did take some lessons while I was out there with a private tutor and I was paying eight dollars an hour. Wow. Which okay. is really good. Yeah. And I took her class. I think I took it for 10 days, one hour a day. Cool. And that was just to brush it because I already have a Spanish foundation. Yeah. So it's just brushing up, keeping gotcha. keeping it fresh, mm-hmm. right? Um, I think Spanish lessons range between $8 and $12 an hour there. I bet. For with a private tutor. Yep. Yeah. You can also do a lot of group classes. I have a lot of friends that went to Toucan Spanish School in, okay. in Medellin, which yeah. is also like they organize kind of group outings as well. So it's mm-hmm. a good way to meet people. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Colombia, highly recommended. Can't wait to go back. Yeah. It's fantastic. I actually have a travel guide on it, um, a really short, succinct travel guide on it, but I'll link it here yeah. so everyone can kind of check it out. There you go. And Peru. Peru, my favorite thing was the food. Oh, yeah. You're going you're gonna to disagree with me on this one. But it's the seafood. <laughs> a lot of seafood. Ceviche, Peruvian yeah. ceviche, one of the top in the world. Mm-hmm. Actually... Peru, con, per, Peruvian cuisine is consistently ranked one of the top cuisines in the world. I, I believe that because sometimes when I have per, Peruvian food here mm-hmm. in the U.S., I think it's great. So I can't even imagine what it's, it's going to taste fantastic. like. fantastic. Okay. And you can try things like cuy, which is guinea pig down there. Mm. Um, rabbit, conejo. Wow. Yep. Whoa. I didn't eat any of this stuff because I don't eat meat. I just eat seafood. Okay. Um, but... Three of the top ten restaurants in the planet yeah. are in Lima, and I spent almost two weeks in Lima. Okay. So, of course, my friends and I had to had to go. Uh, one of the top, like, five is Central, and mm-hmm. uh, we couldn't get in because we were trying to make a reservation, like, two weeks before. Ah. You literally got to make a reservation, like, three months in advance. So we tried to get into Central, and we couldn't. Okay. So instead, we went to Astrid y Gaston. Okay. Um, we were able to do lunch there, and we had a degustación, which is um, like a 14-course, like multiple courses. Jeez. Okay. 14-course meal for <clears throat> lunch. Of course, lunch is going to be cheaper than dinner. Yeah. We are able to get in with a reservation for the four of us. For 14 courses, it was 150 U.S. Per person. Yes. That's nothing, Ooh. though. You go to a multi-course meal in the U.S., it's going to run you 400 bucks. Oh, yeah. So... Right. We thought this was amazing, yeah. and we had to do it because we're like, we don't know when we're ever going to be back at one of the top restaurants in the world, That's or true. back in Lima, yeah, Peru. and get a reservation, yeah, in one of them. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think the trade off with that was that we had to go for lunch instead of dinner because okay. they're like, we don't uh, have any dinner rezos, but gotcha. we have space for lunch, and we're like, let's do it. Yeah. And I just love that while I was there, I was with a group that was down to do that. Mm. Oh, yeah, for sure. Also, my favorite ceviche restaurant mm-hmm. uh, ever is in this little uh, Mercado in Lima. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like, I don't know if it's in, it's a little bit of a grungier part of Lima, mm-hmm. but um, one of the locals showed it to me and it's fantastic. But they have pulpo, which is octopus in their ceviche. And octopus is very expensive. Typically. So I know you, <laughs> she's like vomiting in her mouth <laughs> of me talking about this, but I love octopus. And to have octopus in your ceviche and a bowl of ceviche in mm. Peru yeah. is literally like $2 wow. for a good size bowl. So okay. one thing that was also popular throughout anywhere you went in South America was a menu del día, which is oh. a special of the day. Okay. So you usually get it for lunchtime yeah. and it'll be anywhere from like 5 to $10. But it'd be like four courses. Nice. So you have like your appetizer, your main meal, your side dish, your dessert, and a drink. Okay. And so that was always worth getting because oh, it's yeah. like, oh, you get so much food. Yeah. And so in Peru, a lot of the menu del días were, um, uh, or, or a lot of like ceviche and seafood. Yeah. So I remember my combo at my favorite ceviche restaurant mm-hmm. was like a bowl of ceviche plus um, 
I can't remember the corn drink. It was one of my favorite drinks. as a purple corn drink when you're down there. Okay. Um, but it would be like $2.50. Wow. For your soup, your ceviche, and a drink. Nice. So the food oh, in man. Peru was definitely yeah. my favorite thing about that country. So it was tasty and it was cheap. Yes. And seafood, like Argentina just doesn't have the seafood that Peru does. Okay. And Colombia, you got to search for it. Mm. It's not a staple in the Colombian yeah. cuisine. Okay. And definitely not in the Argentine cuisine. Yeah. So um, Peru is where it's at. And I, I love seafood in general, so I was really excited yeah. when I got there. And they use a lot of different flavors and herbs and spices. Right. And even um, there's a lot of Asian influence in Peru. Okay. A lot of um, Japanese and some like Chinese and Korean influence as gotcha. well. Okay. Yeah, so they'll have a mix, mixed, uh, mixed cuisines okay. that fuse Asian and Peruvian cuisine. Dope, dope. Yeah, I felt like Colombia and Peru were on the same level as far as pricing as for the okay. things that I wanted to eat. Gotcha. Which I mean, if you're pescatarian and you're mm-hmm. in a country that doesn't really cater to vegetarians, you're essentially going to carbo load yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> instead. Right. So um, those things, bread and cheese, no matter where you go, are typically yeah. cheap anywhere okay. you go. Sweet. Um, it was when you start getting to like the meats where it gets pricey, right? Okay. So um, I thought Argentina was a little bit pricier for South America, yeah, but cheap for if you're coming down with U.S. dollars, oh, yeah. right? Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. So. So those all sound very yummy <laughs> for all the pescatarians and <laughs> people who eat seafood. Mm-hmm. Um, so good. But food is always a lovely thing, like in different countries. But what was what would you say hardest um, part of the whole year? I think the takeaways from the year was being away. What was hard was being away from family and friends and their okay. big life events that year. Mm-hmm. But I did this on purpose yeah like I chose to leave for a year yeah no one forced me to exactly so I had to learn how to deal with that mentally and emotionally I'm like you decided this like Mm -hmm. if you really wanted to be back home if you're so upset about missing these events then go back home right but what I wanted more was to do this for myself and Mm -hmm. to go exploring yeah and to make this change and to really be on my own and grow as a person for sure so that was something I struggled with but it was, I kind of worked through it the yeah. first few months, right? Mm-hmm. After maybe, I'd say I was completely comfortable yeah. after my fourth month away. Mm-hmm. Always have a backup plan. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. What was the biggest lesson you learned of being by yourself throughout the whole year in a different country? Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. I think the biggest lesson I learned was how to live with so little. Mm-hmm. I knew... The whole thought was, I'm in Vegas. I'm going to pack up my two-bedroom apartment where I've been stuffing my life for the past three years and buying useless things, things that I didn't even know I had. For sure. Um, I remember when I I came to this revelation when I cleaned out my apartment in Vegas and I was moving out, Mm -hmm. there was just so much crap. And I'm like, what am I going to do with all this? I sold most of my furniture, uh, a lot of important documents and little things I just kept in a storage Mm -hmm. in my hometown. Yeah. Um, most of, a lot of my clothes, but I got rid of so much stuff when I was leaving Vegas. So that was part one. Yeah. Getting rid of all that, learning that I'm like, I don't need any of this stuff. And also, what were you wasting your money on, Leah? Right, yeah. So, second part of that was learning to condense my life into a backpack. Ooh, yeah. And after repacking and repacking almost every few months, Mm -hmm. I finally whittled it down to, you know, like 25 pounds by the end of the year. That's great. And um, a 25-pound backpack by the end of the year. And I'm like, this is it. I can, you know, like I can make so many different outfits out of what I have. Like I can buy anything I truly need. And like I was living out of hostels, out of Airbnbs, out of um, homestays. I was living out of a backpack and a day pack and – I I just bought what I needed. I I learned to live minimally. And it was something that I would love... Before I went into it, I was like, I would love for this to happen, but I wasn't expecting it to happen. Yeah. Because if I was expecting it to happen and it didn't, Mm -hmm. 
then I'd be disappointed. Or if I was expecting it to happen and I didn't like it, yeah, yeah, yeah. then I'd be angry. I'd be disappointed. But the the side effect was that I loved that it changed my whole way of yeah. thinking. I know that sounds really lame, but like that year no. backpacking abroad really yeah. did does shift your mindset a lot. I bet that it does. And even now my everyday life, like I only buy what I need. I'm yeah. very... I try to be pretty frugal. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm like, do you need, is this a need or is this a want? Want. Yeah. yeah. So to kind of minimize my stuff, because, you know, when you, when you take off again, you move again, there's just more crap for you to throw out or clean yeah. up or, know. you know, and like I said, I work off a zero based budget. So every dollar I spend goes to something. Yeah. It's allocated to something. Mm-hmm. So, um, awesome. And, uh, you know, bring double the amount of money you think you need. For sure. <laughs> yep. Um, the reason I started bartending my way through Peru is because I was running like lower on funds. Uh-huh. And uh, like I said, not that it it helped me to stop spending money at all. I was just spending money much, much, much slower. Yeah. Um, I'd say overall I spent six weeks in Cusco. Mm-hmm. Guess how much I spent in six weeks overall for my life to live there, including traveling to Machu Picchu, my food, okay. my drinks, everything. I like this game. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I want to say 350 US. Oh, no, I wish. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, 500. It was $600. $600? Okay. $600 okay. for six weeks. Yeah. You're li- you lived life. Right. Like, that's... It's 100 a week. Nothing. Yeah. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. So... Props. Um, thank you. <laughs> and then... <clears throat> Learn to value my time with people even yeah. more. I think this was big because I was meeting people from all over the world. It's amazing. All over the world, different cultures, countries that I'd never even met mm-hmm. people from before. Yeah. Also, the greatest things I learned was the view of of the, the view of American politics through others' eyes. Because okay. you will learn so much more just talking and having a conversation to other people about what they think of. Americans. Our of of Americans in general, not just politics, but our healthcare, our education, oh, right, of a, right. everything that's going on in our country. Yeah, um, gun control is the one that frequently yeah. comes up. You'll learn more from talking to people um, in other from other countries mm-hmm. about American politics and policies than you'll ever learn from any news a U.S. news media outlet yeah. ever. Ever. So I think that's so important yeah. because it keeps you open-minded and it keeps you learning and it keeps things, you know, kind of controversial. Right. You get other opinions. Yeah. Um, you learn what people think. So so that's really eye-opening, to yeah. be honest. And really how to be my, by myself in a foreign country, mm-hmm. in a country that you don't speak their language, they don't speak yours, and right. um, you learn what to do with your time. You learn what you like, what you'll tolerate, what you put up with. Yeah. You learn how strong and resilient you can be. Mm-hmm. Um, and you learn new ways of entertaining yourself <laughs> and, and how to be alone and how yeah. to meet new people. Because when you're alone, you want to be with people sometimes. So yeah. it's like, how do you go out right. and meet others? And that's also another entire other episode that we're going to have. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was a really cheesy to say but a really life altering year and experience to have and I wouldn't trade any part of it for the world I think um it was crazy just I think Peru up leveled it and gave me a whole different experience by literally bartending my Mm -hmm. way through the country being able to meet a lot of locals and um really settling down like having long chunks of time in each country so you could integrate with the culture Mm -hmm. was also um amazing and and uh informative um and a weird thing was i this is like really random but i actually lost 25 pounds that year oh i lost a lot of weight that year (laughs) because we spent one week in the caribbean in an island called san andres probably Mm -hmm. my favorite week one of my favorite weeks of my life my entire life (laughs) on this planet and i hadn't been in humidity that bad all year wow and because we were there, it's an it's an island that belongs to Colombia, but it's in the Caribbean, just east of Nicaragua. Oh, interesting. Yep. Okay. And it was so humid there that I literally stopped eating. I'm not even kidding. I <laughs> yeah, stopped eating. Yeah, I get that eating. feeling too in humidity. <laughs> I stopped Seriously. eating. I was trying to just drink water. I was barely even drinking alcohol because I'm like, I don't want to be drunk in this heat because yeah. I will pass out. For sure. And 
I lost so much weight and I continued to stay in humidity. And then when I got to Peru, I lost even more weight because I was literally rationing my food. I was pretty much eating mm. one meal a day. So okay. I was probably on a thousand calories a day. Wow. Which is not that great. Yeah. Um, I, I looked, I thought I looked good in pictures, but I definitely was not healthy. <laughs> She's not healthy. <laughs> yeah. So oh, interesting. some interesting, some interesting things came yeah. out of that year. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> wow. The humidity was that bad. Yeah. It was wild. Well, I also wasn't used to it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I had been in pretty temperate or cold mm. weather all year up until then. So I went from yeah. like one extreme yeah, to another. the other. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now you just thrive on humidity. I thrive on it. I do. My skin and my hair are glowing. Yeah. And the humidity. Yep. So I love it. What would you do differently? Um, not much, but if I were to do two things differently, I would have started working for accommodation earlier Okay. in the year because in Argentina, I, I generally was just blowing my money. Yeah. I was like, oh, I'll buy four cocktails tonight. Not a problem. And <laughs> you know, that would come out to $40, $50 just mm-hmm. on drinks. Yeah. And, um, that is, a, you could stay for a week somewhere on $40, $50 for like a hostel or an Airbnb. Right. So I didn't start doing work for accommodation until my ninth month there. Mm. And if, you know, I would have done it earlier to slow the money down and yeah. I probably could have traveled for longer, but water under the bridge, nothing yeah. you can do about it now. Right, right. But yeah, I, I think I would have looked into that earlier. I think also a, a factor was like pride. I was like, oh, I don't want to like work. I just want to have yeah. fun yeah. and meet new people and explore new things. So I'm like, I don't want to work. I'll just pay for a comment. I'll pay for everything. Right. But yeah, I, I probably would have done that earlier. But you know, if I ever decide to go off on a year again, then now I know what to do. <laughs> for sure. You're ready. And I said this earlier, but definitely go with more money. I mean, I thought I went with a decent amount, but you can never be too sure. Yeah. One of the mentalities, one of the thoughts I had, part of my mentality before going was I don't want to say no to anything. Mm-hmm. And I didn't. My friend said, you want to come to Chile? I was like, yeah, I'll come to Chile. Come wine tasting with you guys. You want to come to Brazil and That's jump nice. off a mountain with us? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I'll come hand gliding in Brazil with you guys. Yeah. For $140, which was pretty expensive. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, do you want to move to Colombia? Do you want to go on these boat tours? Do you want to come to Peru? Do you want to right. go to Machu Picchu? I was like, I said yes to everything I wanted to do. What was your form of transportation throughout the whole trip? Oh, or the yeah. whole life mm-hmm. of the year in South America? Well, between countries, I flew. Bought okay. flights. Gotcha. Side note, the only time I've ever been on Emirates, Ooh. which is one of the top airlines on the hey, planet. Yeah. The only time I've ever been on Emirates was from Rio, Brazil to Buenos Aires, Argentina. Because <laughs> it was a connector flight. Oh, okay. Right? So they were coming from like Dubai to yeah. Rio to Buenos Aires was okay. the final destination. Yeah. And I got that flight for about $300. Ooh. But, um, you know, I flew to, I flew from Buenos Aires to Santiago, Chile for mm-hmm. like $120 one way. Okay. So And were these flights kind of like you were purchasing as you go? Yeah, I purchased okay. as I went for sure. And then uh, in the country, mm-hmm. I would usually bus. Okay. Um, it's always two things when you're traveling. It's time or it's money, right? Yeah. You're giving up one or the other. So actually when I went down to Bariloche, I went uh, to Patagonia. I went my second month there and I flew down there. You could take a bus. It would be yeah. about 18 hours, I'd say. Okay. Um. And it'd be pretty cheap, but I flew down there. I can't remember how much I flew down there for, but it was like a two-hour flight. Mm. Um, it was obviously very affordable because I paid for it. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, no problem. Right, right. Um, and then I flew up to Iguazu, but I know people that bust up to Iguazu mm-hmm. Falls, and it was a 30-hour bus ride, which I think that's like the longest bus ride I've ever heard of in my Ooh. entire life. Yeah. And Peru, I bust everywhere, but okay. I was with, I was traveling with, an amazing group of six people. They're still my favorite, one of my favorite travel wow. groups to date. We all got tattoos together. I don't know if you can see it, but oh, I have that's a, awesome. a paper airplane. Yeah. Aww. And um, there's four Americans, one Australian and one Czech guy. Mm-hmm. And we took most of our buses together, which is why it yeah. made a 12 hour bus ride bearable, you cool. know? Yeah. But I mean, man, a 12 hour bus ride in Peru will cost you like eight bucks. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Super cheap. Yeah. Mm-hmm. For sure. I think my longest bus ride that year was from 
Cusco back to Lima, which you can fly. A lot of people fly. It's like mm. an hour. Okay. But on bus, it was 22 hours. Oh, man. And I, I slept know. through... <laughs> most of um i slept through most of it because in south america it's very easy to find um help in a pharmacy to help you sleep that you would normally Ah, need a prescription for in the u.s yeah but uh literally you just go to the pharmacy and say hey i need a pill that helps me sleep and uh no prescription needed and you buy it over the counter and nice yeah longest bus ride for me was 22 hours which was nuts and honestly didn't feel like it which was good okay that's a good thing yeah that was south america in a nutshell that for me sounds fun yeah come it's on guys lot. book that ticket right now <laughs> ticket to anywhere in south america yeah <laughs> um That's awesome well thank you for sharing oh yeah, thank you yeah. i'm glad you got to hear a lot of the ins and outs of, of of my trip down there check us out on youtube we have a visual podcast ticket to anywhere podcast and we're also on twitter instagram facebook but our twitter handle is t number two a podcast facebook and instagram it's ticket to anywhere podcast yep i can't wait to talk to you guys there let us know if you've been to south america i definitely want to know how you guys did it i know some people did uh peru hop the bus a lot of people did the san blas islands i didn't get to that a lot of people traveled around brazil and i only touched the falls and rio so Mm -hmm. if you've been to south america or you have any questions about the continent i know that's overwhelming because it's (laughs) the continent um, we'd love to hear your thoughts. We'd love to hear from you guys. Awesome. All and right. listen to us on all of your streaming platforms, Spotify, Apple, Anchor, Stitcher, Google Podcasts. Check us out. I'm Trizzy. And I'm Leah, LA in flight. And thank you again for listening to another episode of Ticket to Anywhere podcast. Yeah, see you soon.